Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our All Seed Rate Clinic to preem or not to preem. As the slide previously stated, you are all currently muted and you will be muted throughout the presentation. But if you have any questions for David, then please use the Q&A button. It'll either be at the top or the bottom of your screen. This webinar is also being recorded and I'll send it around to you all in the next couple of days. Before we start the clinic, I'd just like to draw your attention to our new Seabed Slugs and Stewardship Hub, which we launched last week. David will be posting seasonal updates and crop management advice throughout the autumn. So please feel free to go on our website and subscribe and these messages will be sent directly to your inbox. There is also one basis point available if you subscribe. Okay, back to today's clinic. So similar to last week, we have some poll questions which we'd like to launch to you throughout the presentation. So here's an example which should pop up on your screen now. Thinking of your all seed rate crops, what proportion do you normally plan to apply a pre-emerge herbicide to? And all you guys need to do is select an answer. And what we'll do is we'll address all the answers to our poll questions at the end of today's presentation. Okay, I'd like to introduce my colleague, David Roberts, who is Adama's herbicide technical specialist. David has over 30 years experience in agronomy, specializing in weed management. He also has a wealth um, of knowledge in the herbicide sector in the UK, Ireland and Europe. David, over to you. Thank you very much, Shelby. Good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we are going to look at the Aussie rate crop. Um, it's possibly a crop under pressure. Um, there's been problems with cabbage stone flea beetle lately. There's the continuing problem with blackgrass, and there's also broadleaf weeds to address. We have stewardship issues that we need to bear in mind with metazoclor, quinmarac, and very much so with metaldehyde. Uh, we will focus today on some of those issues, but clearly we're going to start by looking at the scenarios which might present options for whether we use a pre-emergence herbicide or whether we choose to actually wait and use a post-emergence herbicide. We're very grateful for the questions that have been sent in. It helps the, uh, helps the webinar flow. So if we move on to our first set of questions, we can get underway. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions here, starting with one from Laura. What are your thoughts on pre versus post stem weed control given establishment issues? We also have a question from Rory. Do pre-ems affect the early growth of all seed rape? Does not using them enable the plant to grow stronger and quicker before going with a post stem? Thanks, Abby. Uh, thank you, Laura, for that question. Yeah, very pertinent. Obviously, I, I mentioned cabbage stone flea beetle. It's uh, becoming a, a bigger problem. There are certain counties of England where it's become very, very difficult to establish all seed rape, even to the extent where you think it's established and you still lose it. Uh, I know in areas last autumn, they were lost through drought as well, and we continue to have problems. So these establishment issues are very real and they do need to be addressed. And the choices come down to, do we wish to invest in a crop and we're not sure whether it will survive or not, which is the pre am option, or do we wait until there is something of a crop established, although it still can come under pressure from flea beetle, and choose to do a post stem application. There are advantages, there are disadvantages for both approaches. I think it comes down largely to past history, experience of the region you are, and what the current weather conditions are as the crop has been drilled and, and is establishing. That will help uh, form your judgment on the best way to make the application. Whether you do use a pre-em or not use a pre-em, uh, the question from Rory about how this may affect the establishment and the early growth of the Aussie grape crop. We know from experience for sure that certain herbicides when applied and particularly if closely followed by a significant amount of rainfall, we do know that they can affect the early establishment period. 
The counter to that, of course, is, is waiting for the post M application. Then if weeds do germinate, then they will be competing with the crop. Uh, chickweed particularly can be quite aggressive in the early stages of growth and compete with the Aussie grape crop. If we look at some of the options whereby pre-emergence has its advantages, uh, you can, although admittedly with Aussie Drake there's very little time, but there may be the possibility to use non-selective herbicides before emergence. The residual nature of a pre-emergence means that the herbicide is down as the weeds germinate, so you're eradicating that competitive element very early in the growth of the crop. And it is it's not perhaps as key as it is within cereals to get a pre-M down, but I certainly believe that the application of a pre-M herbicide can have in certain seasons a significant impact on the overall control of blackgrass at the end of the program. Allied to the pre-emergence options, there are disadvantages as well. I'm sure you'll know some of these. Referring back to Rory's question, if we look at crop, est crop establishment being a little bit uncertain, then do you choose to invest the money in a pre-emergent herbicide or do you wait? It's sometimes unclear. It is difficult sometimes. There's a lot going on on the farm at this time of year. You'll still be carrying on with harvest. We're looking at predominantly uh, August timing for this, for it for, to be a true pre-emergence application. There is limited time to get this true pre-emergence onto the crop before it emerges and the weeds emerge. Dry seed beds, uh, I talked about significant rainfall. Well, conversely, dry seed beds as well can lead to the pre-emergence not being taken up sufficiently by the weeds, and that obviously leads to poorer control. If we then look at the post-emergence side of it, again, advantages and disadvantages. Weed spectrum, when you're making a post-emergence application, you can largely see what's there. Now, admittedly, Farmers and good agronomists, they've got a pretty good idea which weeds are going to germinate in, in which fields and even in which parts of which fields. But you may be surprised the difficulty we have setting trials. We think, for example, we're going to get a pretty much guaranteed population of poppy, let's say, and they just don't germinate for whatever reason in that year. So at least with the post-emergence application, you know the weed spectrum. You've got a better understanding of what's there and consequently which active ingredients to use. Again, the crop is more established. I'm not saying it's necessarily beyond the timing when flea beetles, slugs, pigeons, other problems can occur. But at least you know you've got a crop that you're working with at that time if you choose to go down the post-emergence route. And if you're doing the combined, and by that I mean you, you're utilising a pre-emergence and a post-emergence follow-up, then you've got the opportunity to catch any escapees from the pre-emergent application. Looking at the disadvantages for post-emergent herbicide applications, again, if the weather's against us or time pressures, work pressures are against us, the soils are warm, if there's a bit of rainfall, the weeds can get large relatively quickly. So it may be that they go beyond the growth stage where the herbicides are going to have the best activity. So we need to think of that. Some situations, the soils might get too wet. Uh, it makes traveling difficult. This may not happen uh, too many times, but it is very frustrating if you're planning to use a post-emergence application of a herbicide because you're waiting for better crop establishment and then the weather closes in and we can't actually get on because the fields are too wet. And lastly, crop canopies. If we do wait, and I'm not talking the early post-emergence time and perhaps the slightly later post-emergence timing, if you've got a rapidly establishing also grape crop, then you can have the canopy hiding the target weed, which may result in reduced weed control. Thank you, David. Next, we've got a very short and sweet question from Robert here. Why should I use metazaclor? Thank you, Robert. Yeah, um, metazaclor, probably one of the main building blocks of herbicide control in all drape crops now for many years. Uh, the advantages are it's got a, a pretty good spectrum and you've got the option to go pre-emergence and or post-emergence. So the, there are a lot of attributes which would make you, make you consider metazaclor. One of the things that is concerning us at the moment clearly is the metazaclor matters stewardship needs to be adhered to. 
Metazochlor is one of the active ingredients that is found in, in water, so we need to be conscious of that. Why you should use metazochlor? As I've said, it has activity on grass weeds, and it's got a pretty wide spectrum of broadly weeds, especially if you choose to go with the pre-emergent application. Some years, it can give very useful contributions to a start in the blackgrass control program. Nobody would use metazochlor alone to control blackgrass, but it's a component of the program and it can do a good job. Another advantage is the insurance. You've actually got a herbicide on, so whether it's pre-em or early post-em, getting metazochlor or metazochlor mixes on early means you at least you do have some herbicidal activity on that field if conditions turn wet. Competitive element, removing the weeds early is clearly an advantage. It helps with the establishment of the orchard grape crop. So if you can get that on, then that's going to help the orchard grape get away and hopefully stand pressure from, from other problems such as slugs, such as flea beetle later on. And as I mentioned, you do have, with many of the metazochlor products, be they straights or mixes, you do have the flexibility to plan a pre-emergence. You could decide against it, but you've still got the product. You can actually make an early post-emergence application as well. So there are a number of reasons to still consider the use of metazochlor in OCRI. Okay, and our next question is from Duncan. With winter all seed rape in flea beetle affected areas likely to be sown earlier, if sown at all, how do we effectively control black grass without impacting on water? Very good, very good question, Duncan. Uh, this is going to be at the front of people's minds at the moment, I'm sure. Um, I've, I've already briefly touched on the pressure from flea beetle. Uh, I can see that may well drive to earlier drilling, try and get the crop established so it can withstand flea beetle attack better. Um, let's hope that they are going to be sown, but I, I do appreciate that in certain areas it is proving very difficult. And of course, we need to be getting on top of black grass without impacting on water. It, it's a very complex issue, a uh, very complex issue. If we want to give us the best opportunity to control black grass, obviously without impacting on water. I've made the comparison with the cereals programs. We, we knew, we're now using components, we're now using stacking, we're now using sequencing. What I would like to see happen is where feasible, we get the best active ingredients, the most effective active ingredients on black grass applied outside the window where the risk is highest to water. And that is primarily after drains begin to flow. You, you, yes, you can have flash flooding, which can cause a problem, but obviously when you, you get probably towards late October, but more likely into November when drains are flowing, if we can get the effective application, sorry, the application of effective products on before that window, then that gives us a better opportunity. Obviously with the earlier drilling, you're gonna have probably next to no opportunity to do a stale seed bed before the crop goes in, the black grass is going to emerge very early, so you do have to make the applications early. To do that, I think there needs to be an element of changing use of, of product use patterns. Um, that's something that we need to see happening. It, it is beginning. Uh, it is beginning. We, we have repositioned uh, with an additional option for the application of crawler. It still can be applied up until the end of February, but what we've done now is got label approval for applications much earlier. The graph which is on the screen now shows the difference in timing of application between September and December and what happened in, in, sorry, in autumn 2016 was a much larger percentage of the crawler which was applied in that period was applied early on. So we are beginning to see that, but I do think we need to keep driving this we need to retain these active ingredients. We need to retain carbetamide. We need to retain propizamide. Without those, it's going to be very, very difficult. So that's what we need to do. We need to focus on changing use patterns. Okay, thank you, David. So I'm just going to launch another poll now. So we're interested to know, have you changed the application time of your crawler? And why you guys vote? Let's move on to our next question. 
What considerations should you give to minimise the development of herbicide resistance? And that's a question from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. That's um, that's quite a subject, isn't it? Um, we, we could probably do a whole thesis on this. Um, yes, we absolutely have to do whatever we can to minimise herbicide resistance developing. We, we know it's, it's very widespread in black grass, it's in rye grass, it's in wild oats, it's in broadleaf weeds with the ALS inhibitors, chickweed, poppy, mavid, etc. We do need to be very conscious of this. Uh, we, we can't go into this in any great depth this morning, but here is a snapshot of just some of the things that need to be considered. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list, but certainly all these components, I would say, are very important. Drilling time. There are advantages and disadvantages with how we approach these things. Delayed drilling, it gives us the opportunity to remove any black grass or herbicide, weed, herbicide resistant weeds, which are there before the crop goes in by delaying drilling. Unfortunately, in most cases, delaying drilling, there is likely to be a yield penalty. So where is the, the, the balance for that? Cultivation techniques. We all understand the importance of not burying, for example, black grass seed too deeply if we're using products such as carbetamide and propizamide. Uh, as I've said, very important active ingredients. If we bury the, the black grass seed too low, then that can reduce activity. That isn't to say, of course, that we shouldn't consider the use of rotational ploughing. There is still time, there is still room for it in some, some rotations. Rotation is another way. One thing we've seen over the last three to five years, perhaps, is an increase, I would say, certainly in central and eastern England, of spring cropping. Um, now, that takes the pressure off because it gives us the opportunity to do something about resistant weeds, resistant blackgrass, outside the crop which is actually being cultivated for that season. Roguing, a uh, terrible job, but a very important job especially in the early stages. If we notice patches of weeds which have been inadequately, inadequately controlled by herbicides, then it's worth getting in and roguing them. Variety choice, that can have an impact. The growth habit in the autumn, for example, should you consider using something like a, a hybrid barley because of its vigor in the autumn, can that have an effect? Ally that with uh, seed rate as well, increasing seed rate can have an effect. Preventing the spread of resistance is important. Now that comes down to hygiene, um, machinery moving from one field to another or one location to another. Uh, we've been giving the advice for some time now, if you've got a particularly badly infested field, then that should be the one that is harvested last. Of course, if it happens to be milling wheat in that field, you may not want to delay it too long, but these are all considerations. And it's only after all these considerations, and there are others such as cover cropping, which can have a benefit, it's only then that we get to herbicide choice. We start thinking about which herbicides we use. We start thinking about the mode of action. We cannot rely on the same mode of action repeatedly in the same crop or even across the rotation. We need to change mode of action, and we now even need to start thinking about site of action. What we need to do is use different ones across the rotation. And after that, where we're unsure about the final performance of the herbicide, we need to map them. We need to assess herbicide performance. We need to investigate any reason for poor performance and address that in following crops. So there's, there's a whole host of things that can be done. And this is really just a, a very quick snapshot of some of the options available to us. Thanks, David. Our next question is from Ken. What is the best program to control resistant black grass? Thank you, Ken. Uh, yes, I've, I've, I've made the comparison already. Uh, we're in a situation now in Orsi Drake where uh, a few years ago, certainly within my experience, you may only need to put one application of propizamide on and that would have done the job. Uh, carbetamide, there's no resistance in black grass. Propizamide, there's no resistance in black grass. But I really don't think that using products in isolation is, is the way to go. If we look at this example, uh, looking at the post-emergence applications, trying to control black grass, then there are options. But I, I do think I keep making this comparison with 
the use of stacking and sequencing. The label for crawler now has an early application timing, so you can use that in conjunction with a later application of probizomide. What we're looking at potentially for uh, the most robust program is under the right conditions, metazacor, as I've already said, can make a contribution. We then might be looking at a post-emergence, early post-emergence application of crawler uh, with a graminicide such as Falcon. I do think that in most situations, clethodim is still the best performing foliagraminicide. So I, I, I don't doubt that will still continue to be used. And propizomide, as I've said, no known resistance to that or crawler is probably going to be the product that is used at the end of the program because it needs the, the cooler soils to give it the most persistent activity. So those are the, are the elements of what goes into building a successful program to control black grass in autumn gray. Thanks, David. If we lost propizomide, would the area sown to all seed rate decrease or are there enough suitable alternative products? And that's a question from Ian. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, it, it's under a lot of pressure, propizomide. Uh, it, it gets detected in water frequently. Uh, but as I've already mentioned, it, it, it's absolutely imperative that we do retain its use. We, we need to steward these products properly propizomide, metazoclor, carbetamide. And I'm afraid to say I do think that if propizomide was lost, there may be the chance that carbetamide will be lost as well. And in that situation, it's going to make it very, very difficult to grow all seed rape in areas with significant blackgrass pressure, with the added pressure then on the overall arable rotation. We know it's difficult to control blackgrass in cereal crops. We do have the opportunity at the moment to use propizomide in those crops. If we lose propizomide, I don't think currently there are enough suitable alternatives. And, and it would, in my opinion, lead potentially to a decrease in the cropping area because it would make it too difficult to grow or seed rape in those areas profitably. OK, and our next question from Michael. What options have I got to go late when the crop has established properly? Right, we've got a good crop. Thank you, Michael. It's, it's nice to have a good crop in the ground. So we, we're beyond that difficult early establishment phase and we're looking at now the options of what can be used for herbicides later on. If, if we go back to a similar version of what we've just been looking at, uh, I, I would imagine that we may or may not have put on a metazoclor based product so that's gone on either pre-emergence or early post-emergence. We've then, in a black grass situation, put on a foliar graminicide, most likely clethodim. The options later in the season, although we talk about the new recommendations for crawler, you can still put that onto a well-established crop in late autumn. We just need to be aware of the water stewardship issues, use the Adama Water Aware app, for example, and the primary options in that late autumn stroke over winter period are crawler, propizomide, and of course, propizomide aminopyrrolid, which has proved to be very popular. Beyond that, in an established crop, then really we're looking at spring applications, tidying up broadleaf weeds. Uh, clopyrrolid products can be applied after the 1st of March. So we've got straight clopyrrolid, we've got clopyrrolid with pictharam, which gives you improved activity on cleavers. Uh, and we also have Fox, Bifonox, which can help with tidy up in the spring. So if we've got an established crop, we, we've got some good options that, that can really do a good job on finishing a weed control programme for us. OK, our next question is from Jay Harris. How do I approach early weed control without relying on metazoclor products? Metazoclor, as I've said, you know, it, it, it's been a very significant building block in all seed rape herbicide programs for many years now. But with the occurrence of it in water, then it's come under some pressure. We've got the metazoclor matter stewardship. Uh, for a few years now, there has been a dimethenamid P quimerac option, which doesn't contain metazoclor. That is, is one option worth considering. There is another new option uh, for this year, uh, Parish. Uh, Parish, we believe, is a very valid non-metazoclor option. 
it, it fills the gap. The gap I'm referring to is we talked about how effective propizomide aminopyrrolid is. Well, if you're nervous about making a pre-emergence application, you're not sure about using metazoclor, there's a gap there where especially broadly weeds can flourish. And to fill that gap, we can use Parish as a contact herbicide, not affected by soil type, activity on a, a range of broadleaf weeds. Chickweed is an important one. Uh, I've already said it can establish quickly and cause competitive issues with the crop. With parish, we're not adding to the ALS inhibitor burden within the rotation. It's not an ALS inhibitor, so it, it, it gives us some degree of safety with that. It works very well in a sequence with the later residuals, such as propizomide aminopyrrolid. And actually, it's, it's a very complementary weed spectrum to the clearfield chemistry. Uh, the clearfield varieties, they seem to be getting more popular. Uh, there was an uplift in, in the, the, the drilled area last autumn. Um, I think that may continue a bit more for Autumn 17 as well. And one of the advantages with, with Parrish comparing it with metazoclor options is it doesn't limit uh, the following crop options in the event of a crop failure. So the, there are options if we don't want to base our early programs on metazoclor. Thanks, David. So we've had a few questions in around Parrish. Starting off with, with, will Parish control Charlock, Runch and Shepherd's Purse? Thank you, Abby. Uh, yes, Ray, we, we, we've got uh, a number of different weeds where we've, we've got data on the levels of weed control which are achievable. Uh, I've talked about common chickweed. Uh, your, your question about uh, Runch, Charlock and Shepherd's Purse. Charlock, certainly we, we've seen in trials that it can have some benefit in the control of charlock. Similarly with, with Shepherd's Purse, I haven't seen anything which makes me think it's going to give co good control of Runch, but I can confirm that, I can look into it. But certainly activity on charlock, chickweed, mayweed species, groundsel, and activity on Shepherd's Purse as well. And a few more questions here. What following crop restrictions are there after applying Parish? Uh, as we've just seen, actually, uh, using Parish uh, really doesn't limit the following crop options, um, unlike some of the early, other, other herbicides that can be used at that timing. And a question from Selwyn. Are there any tank mixes with post m graminicides? That's a very good question. The, the, the positioning of Parish, which is from two leaves of the altered rape to nine leaves of the altered rape, that overlaps quite clearly with potentially insecticide use for cabbage stem flea beetle and also, as, as you asked, Selwyn, with post endraminicides. At the moment, we're not in a position to recommend them, but it's certainly something we need to look at. Using those foliagraminicides at that time is going to be key to controlling volunteer cereals. If we can apply those together, then it's going to make the job a lot easier on farms. That's something we are going to look at for sure. And our final parish question. How crop safe is it from Richard? Thanks, Richard. Yeah, very good question. I know in the early development of parish in all seed rape, uh, the formulation was actually different slightly to the one that's been launched now. And I do know that if parish was used with metazoclor or if an adjuvant based on a mineral oil was used, then the crop safety wasn't what we wanted. If we use Parish as defined on the current product label, um, i.e. not mixing it with metazoclor, uh, not mixing it with mineral oils, then there shouldn't, any, there shouldn't really be any issues with the crop safety. Okay, thanks David. Before we move on, I'd like to launch another poll question to you all. How likely are you to try Parish as a non metazoclor option? And just while you guys answer, we'll move on to our next question from Anthony. What options are there for controlling chickweed and red shank in spring allseed rape grown on high organic matter soils? Thank you, Anthony. It, it's a very good question. I'm, I'm sure this is causing you some problems. If, if we begin uh, by looking at the spring allseed rape, limited options anyway. 
Uh, and the other element, of course, is, is you're on high organic matter soils, which is going to compound the problem. Looking at the options that are available, the, the most commonly recommended options for weed control in spring oil seed rape tend to be metazoclor or, or clomazone, or there are products available which use those active ingredients in conjunction with each other. But as I'm sure you know, on high organic matter soils, there is a risk that the efficacy of residual pre-emergence applied herbicides can be reduced. If we then switch to look at post-emergence options, uh, not too many there, I'm afraid. Uh, you've got clopyrrolid. Uh, again, we need to do that after the 1st of March. Clopyrrolid can be used on its own or in mix of picloram uh, as a co-formulated product. There is also the FOX EMU, um, the extension of authorization for minor uses. And also there's a lentigran emu. I'm afraid, Anthony, I don't think any of those are really going to get you out of a hole when it comes to chickweed uh, control or red shank control on high organic matter soils. Uh, I don't think I really have an answer for you in that situation, I'm sorry to say. Okay, and our final question today from David. Are there likely to be mixture products containing Fenmedifam available in the future for use on all seed rate? Thank you, David. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something I would like to see uh, develop over time. I know when Fenmedifam was being developed for use in all seed rate that some mixes were tried out. Uh, some of them look quite promising. Uh, unfortunately, the partner active ingredient as yet is not approved for use in the UK, so we clearly can't launch that. But it, it, it is an interesting concept for sure, looking at that early post-emergence timing and, and what other active ingredients, ingredients could be used in mixture with Fermedifam. So that's certainly something I'm keen to look at this autumn. Great. And that brings us to an end of all the questions that you guys pre-submitted. So if you have any questions for David now, please use the Q&A button at the top or the bottom of your screen. Just while I give you a chance to type them in, let's uh, go back to our polling. So our first question was, thinking of your all-seed rate crops, what proportion do you normally plan to apply a pre-M herbicide to? We've got a bit of a mixture here, um, but I think it was a split with the majority saying up to 25% and 76 to 100%. Okay. Our next question was, have you changed the application time of your crawler? And the majority of you said, yes, I now apply earlier, which is, which is great. David, do you have any comments on that? Very good news. It, it, it is something that we need to work on and we all need to work on it together. Uh, the comments I made about uh, stewardship, water protection, we do really need to be moving some of these at risk active ingredients away from the period where they're more likely to get into water. Uh, moving the application of crawler earlier, we did a lot of development work with that, and it, it is key to success in that, I think. Okay, and our final poll question that we asked was, how likely are you to try Parish as a non metazoclor option? And again, the majority of you have said uh, likely, with a few of you saying not likely. Do you have any comments on that, David? What I'd like to do is, is anybody who is, is unsure about it, I'm thinking perhaps of the not likely, then it would be interesting to know your reasons. We can't do that at the moment, but if you could get in touch, if you require further information about the product, then I'm, I'm more than happy to share that with you. Okay. Um, we don't seem to have had any questions in at all. So if that's the case, I'd just like to say thank you for joining. And as always, if you have any feedback at all on, on our clinics, then please do let us know as we're always keen to improve. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much.